With IMT, what it does is it finds this feeling, you use the feeling to go to the imprint, and then you process the imprint, you work on these imprints, so it basically smooths it out. So now when you want to do that thing, you're basing it on evidence and what's with what's actually there, not because of your associations of the past. Welcome to the Adversity to Advantage podcast. I'm Petra Belzebor, and this is the place to discuss tips, tricks, and hacks to build your resilience through your worst rock bottoms and get you to a place of success. I'll be interviewing people from all walks of life, professionals, individuals who've been through their own adversity, and allow them to share their authentic and real life stories, opinions, and ideas about how to utilize our worst rock bottoms and allow them to catapult us into success. Welcome to the show. Welcome everyone to the Adversity to Advantage podcast. I'm very excited after quite a few months of trying to coordinate our diaries. I've got Matt Kendall on the other line. We met, it's a few years ago now, where I did a talk at your platform, Interesting Talks, which no longer exists, but it was running for about seven years. Is that right? Yeah, it sort of exists a little bit. I'll oh, it exists, it. sort of. Okay. Um, so, and I remember I was thinking about it. That was my very first talk where I talked personally about my story. Mm. So I'd done loads of teaching and training and other people's content and things like that. But that was the first platform where I was like, oh, I think I cried on stage. It was all going on, um, but it was a good experience. So thank you for that. Welcome you, did, to you did too, because you came back as well. Oh, yes, I did, didn't yeah. I? Yeah. I did a second one. I did a second mm. one. Um, it was good, good experience for me and a great audience. Um, and you were running that for a while. Now, Matt, give our listeners just a little bit of insight into you. What do you do? I know you're like a serial entrepreneur. You've always got a new idea going. Give us the, the nutshell version of what's going on in your life. So as you were saying about Interesting Talks, Interesting Talks was a meetup group which I started um, about, eight, I think it's eight years ago now. I think it's about yeah. the 11th of January or something I started it in 2012. And I, I, I used to like listening. Well, it all started when I was at school and we actually had this guy come in and to talk about um, drug smuggling. Well, not drug smuggling, but uh, taking drugs through customs. And I... I absolutely loved it, you know, and he was just showing the different concealments and everything. And I just thought, I want to do this as a job. And if I wasn't doing what I'm doing now, because I watch all the things on YouTube, you know, the locked up abroad and customs, yeah, and, it, exactly. and I'd love to do that. Not the immigration side, and I don't find that interesting, but, or, or of taking food, but all the drug concealments I found absolutely fascinating. And so I always like listening to interesting talks from interesting people. Not so much inspirational stuff. Um, when I was much younger, I, I listened to some Tony Robbins and I found it quite interesting, but then I grew to really despise most of that kind of material. And so I, when I was in, so when I was in uh, London, I moved to London 10 years ago, and I thought there's this platform called Meetup. I like listening to interesting talks. I was working like a coaching sort of area. I had lots of access to different people. I thought, well, I like organizing things. I've always organized things. You know, I used to run business events and all that kind of stuff. You know, when I lived in Manchester, I used to run networking events. I thought, how hard can it be? Because I used to run, I used to run band nights. Now, when you've got a band night, you've got security, you've got four bands, you've got bar stuff, you've got all these. So running an actual speaking event is actually very easy compared to running something as complex as that. And it was, and I actually just find organizing stuff relatively easy because I'm very methodical and, you know, I'm very sort of precise and how, how to do things and creating systems. I mean, but also, Matt, you're saying it's easy. I find event, event planning horrific. It is not my skill set. So I love showing up and doing the work and knowing that because there is a lot of steps, just the marketing perspective and visibility and getting the right people in the room and the right speaker and like tech and, you know. It, it is. And the thing is, you know, it's like, but I, I find doing other stuff difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but the things I've been, so people go to me, why, you know, how come you're so confident on stage stuff? It's because I started doing it when I was 15. Yeah. Um, so I've been doing it, you know, over half my life. And so, so when you were 15, was that soon after you'd seen this talk and it excited you? And then I you actually, do you know what? It was about the same time period. No, I actually started doing stand up comedy uh, when Did I was you? 15. Yeah. And 
Um, and uh, it was quite bizarre because I was only yeah because I was only fifteen, and I thought because my dad was a professional speaker, okay, a dinner speaker, and so I I just sort of um, I thought right well I'll, I'll I'll do this then obviously this was the days before YouTube and Instagram and Facebook so if I, I feel really sorry for like people that age now because everything you do now is committed to history digitally right. yes um and so you know i think people take much less risks um publicly doing things performance wise than they ever have done because of the embarrassment factor mm. and so i i started speaking in clubs and comedy and i was so young they had to sneak me in through fire exits and stuff so the managers didn't see and it was quite novel to have a 15 year old on a comedy club and I, I went off to University of Manchester and I got through to the semi-finals of there's a, com, there's a competition called Say You Think You're Funny. And it's a very prestigious event. A lot of people have won it, um, like famous people now have kind of won it. And I was playing football. Um, well, I wasn't playing football. I was revising. And I was in the park and I, the ball came to me as I was walking away and I turned to kick it. And because I wasn't warmed up or anything, I kicked it quite hard. I pulled a muscle in my lower spine and my back went into spasm. And the the um, the finals in Edinburgh, and I couldn't go um, because I put my back out, and yeah. so that was, and I had to miss all my exams at university for the first year. So that was that kind of That's disappointing. Thing. So what I decided to do, and the thing is, when you do comedy, there's an expectation of doing comedy, and I thought I, I didn't like that expectation. The thing is, if somebody doesn't find something funny, they are right because they don't find it funny. Sure. So I've actually got the best of both worlds now. So when I do, because I do a lot of my own talks on IEMT and I do social circles and lots of different stuff. And I talk about quite serious stuff, but I, I understand the mechanics of comedy. So I kind of have the best of both worlds. There's no, expect, there's no expectation to be funny. I can play it straight if it's a more serious audience. So I did a lecture for 200 odd people at the weekend university, if you've heard of it, which was a... Um, Burbeck, I believe, that's 200 psychology students and they don't have a sense of humour. <laughs> and so they really don't. And so I did it very much straight. But when I'm doing more social events, like through funding or through interesting talks, I can make it much funnier and people aren't expecting it. And so if it goes well, it goes really well. If it doesn't, I just don't do it. It's like with a comedian, if things aren't going well, they can't then just not be funny because that is their job. So I've had, I do sort of have the best of both worlds in that sense. And so I started um, interesting talks anyway. And it, I, I just found it quite easy to kind of run. Again, I'm quite methodical. And basically, these are how long it runs for. This is, and I like the social elements of it. Because um, London is a very, very lonely city. Yeah. And it's so I wanted a meetup as a platform where people come and meet each other and, you know, get together. Wasn't well, it quite risky for you? I, I remember way back when, when you were telling me your history that before you came to London to do interesting talks, what was happening right before? What role were you playing or what were you doing? So I remember it was a bit disappointing or something and then you decided on interesting talks? Well, I was living in Manchester yeah. and I'd been to, so I'm originally from York and I moved to Manchester when I was a 18 to go to university and i did a, a degree that was absolutely pointless but this was like 20 odd years ago and this is when you could do a degree that was pointless because you know you don't have the expense of i don't know how much it would cost to do a degree these days i think it'd be about 50 grand with all the you know with all the, yeah. and it was, it was it was called media technology and i knew within the first couple of weeks i didn't want to do it um but i continued doing it the thing is they were teaching us stuff saying just to let you know, what we're teaching you is already out of date. So enjoy your next three years. Literally, it was like that. And so, but it was just on the cusp of social media. This was like 2000 and no, 1999. Sure. So it was before everything kind of really got yeah. going. And so I was doing a lot of sort of, you know, working recording studios, making my own projects, do, doing TV, film, um, and there's a lot of maths and stuff involved that I just had no interest in. But what it did kind of tell me about, what it did sort of teach me was sort of like, this either works or it doesn't. And I've kind of used that sort of mentality, that kind of sort of engineering kind of mentality in therapy. It works or it doesn't. It, there's no kind of grey areas. Either this works or it doesn't work. And I was, um, so I finished university. I was running these band nights and then I, 
I was really interested in NLP. Um, I was very much interested. This is when Darren Brown was really famous oh, and yeah. McKenna, and I was yeah. really interested in about the mind, um, not not psychology, interestingly, but just the mind and sort of hypnosis. And this is when hypnosis was on, on TV quite a bit, and and um, it was like hypnotherapy was starting to become a thing. You know, it's like, and obviously NLP was a was a real '90s thing, really, and that was sort of that was sort of still hanging around. And I, I, was, I started a, um, I was working at BT and I was always running my own companies. I didn't want to work at BT, but it was a suitable follow on from my degree. So I was doing broadband. Uh, I, basically I was coordinating engineers and fixing broadband lines. Uh, but I was running my own companies from there as well. And apparently this is called gross misconduct. Uh, I was having meetings in their meeting rooms. I was using their postage, their franking system. But anyway, they uh, they were not happy about me. I was there for three years, and I, I worked, and I was very good at my job. I just didn't do it very often. Sure. And so, <laughs> and so, um, and I actually remember I, I left. Well, <laughs> I was escorted, escorted off the premises. It was very dramatic. Very dramatic, yeah. And I remember I was escorted off the premises and I thought, I'm going to have to call my parents. And I'm, my parents have paid for me to go to university and all my funding and everything. And I was like, I was really dreading having to call them. You know, because my parents are very proud Yorkshire, you know, very hardworking. And I called them and my dad saw a party that so couldn't hear me. So I spoke to my mum and said, just to let you know, I have been... Uh, released from my contract <laughs> released and, and um my mum actually said to me well i think it's time you actually did something you enjoyed and okay. i was like right it was quite emotional i was like okay and so i started running these band nights more seriously and i started running networking events and i actually started to run an online print and design studio because i was buying so much printing to do with the band nights so this guy liked my attitude about working and customer service and he goes, I want to run this studio. So I was running an online print and design studio. I had two full-time designers, one in Wales, one in Scotland, never met them. And I was coordinating all this design. And I got really interested in marketing. So my flatmate at the time was a carpet cleaner. His dad owned a carpet cleaner. And I got all these tapes called Piranha Marketing by a guy called Joe Polish. And I started listening to all these marketing, direct response marketing. And so I had a real good education in marketing. Like boot camps of DVDs of like, or like... Again, it was for carpet cleaning. It was about direct response. And I just watched it all and I was fascinated. And so I started to build up quite a profitable online design studio. And then I started running business events and I started working from an office. And then I met a hypnotherapist at a business event. And he gave me this piece of paper and said all these things which he did. And he goes, would you like to be hypnotized for £10? And I was like, of course I do. <laughs> yeah. Does it have to do like for an outcome that you're looking to achieve? No. Or it's just like, okay, <laughs> no, he just yeah. says, do you want to be hypnotized for ten pounds? I was like, yeah. I, I didn't think I had any problems. And sure. of course. <laughs> so I went along to his office, and it was a very pokey little small office. On reflection, he was a terrible hypnotherapist, and he had quite a bad lisp as well. So hypnosis was quite an interesting vocation for him because to sit down and relax. <laughs> I was like. <laughs> <laughs> and, and yeah he was he was pretty bad but basically so from this 10 pound thing he goes right i've identified all these problems you've gone to me six sessions i'm like okay and so i did i had six sessions about 300 quid which at the time about 20 years it was a lot and i found it interesting i found most of it hmm, but some of it i found genuinely interesting and he said to me at the end trained to be a hypnotherapist I was trained to be a hypnotherapist okay All right. I was like, why he goes he goes go and train trust me there's something about you and your way of what is trained to be a hypnotherapist which so, you did, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah so I, okay fine so um <laughs> i had a lot of free time on my hands the thing is when i was running the print and design studio I wasn't doing anything because it was all automated. It was all systemized. Um, I was only needed if there was a problem, which wasn't because the way I set stuff up, it wasn't really an issue. So I had a lot of free time and I was making, I wasn't making loads of money, but it meant that I only had to work like an hour a day, really. And I could do what I wanted with the rest of the day. So there's only so much daytime TV you can watch and stuff. So right. I started learning about hypnosis and I went on all these different courses and I read every book and did every course you could do and online trainings and 
I did something really, really quite reckless. I, I went onto Gumtree and I said, I'm not qualified and I'm not insured, but I am free. If you'd like to have a session of hypnosis. And I saw hundreds of people at my house, you know, hundreds. I sometimes have people just turn up. Yeah. Um, I, this, I didn't have a website, you know, just people just turn up. Because on Gumtree, you have an endless supply of slightly crazy people. And I just have, and so my first ever person comes in and I said, so what, you know, what do you want help with smoking? Wait, and she goes, um, I had a stillborn baby eight months ago. And I was like, Ooh. So I started that's doing, that's, and yeah. That's, that's and, into that. and the thing is it helped us so much. And I was like, Oh, okay. And then this other guy comes to me who was quite ill. He was really overweight. Like, like, you know, you walk past him in the street, you go, that's a big man, kind of overweight. And I helped him. And I saw him at a networking event, my own networking event, a few months later. And he comes up and says, oh, hi, Max, how are you? And I was like, and I knew who he was. So I was like, yeah, okay, fine. Um, he goes, oh, that session that we did was really helpful. And I was like, I, I don't, who are you? I, I'm sorry, I just don't. And it was, this, it was a guy called Gerald. In fact, I, Gerard, sorry. And I've got an interview with him on my YouTube somewhere. And he lost eight stone in about six months and i was like you can recognize him yeah, yeah I, I literally didn't know who he was and i was like whoa 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 and i started getting really good at hypnosis and i really liked a guy called tom silver which was an american fellow who did something called emotion replacement therapy it was very much bring it was like the idiomotive response so bringing up feelings in one hand dropping it bringing up the other and he took a very scientific approach to it he's a showman as well but he took a very scientific approach to it and i like that i don't really like positivity or putting happy feelings i don't i don't think it don't, serves any purpose but i the thing is if you have a problem and if you put happy feelings, like live your best life and just think great and what's the lesson we can learn here and all that kind of nonsense, what you've got is not a solution. You've got a time bomb. You've still got this thing festering away and it will come out at some point. And so... If you're saying if you're sort of um, papering over the cracks... So it's, it's putting a bandage over a broken ankle. You know, it's not... You're not dealing with the problem. And so... When I started working with people, I always say, well, what's the problem? Not what do you want, which I know is a very coaching. What's your well-formed outcome? And I always say my outcome is I can make your life less shit. Okay. And that's it. I can make your life less shit. Yeah. And so the thing is, if you have a, a graph, uh, so say that you have super happiness and really unhappy, right? What people tend to do, this is normal. If you're down here, it's like if you push a ball uh, beneath the surface of water it wants to shoot up really high so if you feel crap and depressed low self-esteem whatever label is going around you want to shoot up really high well you can't stay up there forever so what's going to happen you're going to come down you're going to go down even further so what happens you live a very very unstable or even a bipolar type of existence where you're going from one extreme to another and the self-development industry love this because when you're feeling down, there's always another course, there's always something else to sell you and to make you feel great. And unfortunately, a lot of the self-development industry is about mindset and not skill set. And it makes uneducated people feel powerful. And that's unfortunately how it's, what it's based on. It's making, yeah, uneducated people feel powerful because they sometimes, because they want to make you think that mindset is more important than skill set. And I think that's yeah. entirely wrong. I actually agree with that. So um, when you were saying um, like positivity or, you know, that that's not worthwhile, my, my mind, just to put in my own opinion, is that actually there's science behind gratitude practices, for example, that allow your mindset to connect with the other side, like a shift of perspective, right? Um, I, I, I have no problem stuff like that. So I have no problem. Let me make something clear. I have absolutely no problem with anybody trying to better themselves. Of course. That's not my enemy. My enemy are the industrial companies. I've seen it. Yeah, I, I've worked behind. You know, I got into these things, and I've I, I've seen people get. I, I won't name companies or people, but yeah. I've seen people get abused. Yeah, sort of abused. Yeah, and um, by these industrial and 
they target certain people. They target people. It's formulaic and it's like you can see the cell. Like once you know what the industry is like, you can see the process. And equally, I mean, I was raised in a cult. So yeah. it feels very <laughs> like, you know, I am the leader who can your life sort of thing. But I love what you said about mindset, not skill set. So it's not useful to just be like, think like this. I mean, our thoughts have power. But if we think like this, but we don't then put the habits in place to develop our skill set, well, you the, can't you have one without the other, I would have the, thought. There's a, brilliant, there's a brilliant quote I once heard, and I, I wish I wrote it. And it's that mindset without skill set makes for a happy idiot. And I just, I just think it's true. So you have these people and around the NLP community and around a lot of this positivity community, you know, doing a fire walk in a hotel car park in September, being helped on by some divorcees. What's going on? This isn't, this isn't mental health. This is, again, putting so much positivity and feeling great and making your move and roaring and letting out and being authentic. I, I find that people who say they're authentic is just an excuse to be rude. I'm just being my authentic self. No, you're an asshole. You're just being rude. And so I really, so although I was in the self-development industry, and I, I still am, I suppose, I, I hate most of it. And so I kind of came to it, the very kind of like, I'm from the north of England. Cynical. I, yeah, yeah. but I'm also, does this work? Yeah. Does Is this there work an or act not? An outcome? Yeah. And I'm, I'm very much into creating value for people. You know, all the events that I've ever run have been, the best value things you can attend and you get so much value from you know from attending as well that's and nice. that's how i've kind of built my my businesses and my little empire i suppose and so i i started getting really good at hypnosis and i started working more and more with men uh, because men really like my approach because i am again I'm, I'm i don't really want to talk about the problems and so I was developing techniques and tools and strategies to help work in a content-free way of working. So that basically means you don't need to talk about the experience, just the structure of the experience and how it affects you. So I started working with a lot of guys who'd been through a lot of physical and mental abuse, guys who'd been bullied. And, and that naturally led on to me going into what's called the pickup industry or the dating industry, where I had no intention. Um, it's just a lot of stuff to do with confidence is brought into relationships. I never liked, and then obviously there's the whole thing about the game. That was pretty big at the time, Neil Strauss and all those kind of things. Yeah. Kind of. And I moved to London and I moved to London because I was unhappy in Manchester. And um, I was going through a very, very weird time in Manchester. I, I was kind of, I was pretty stagnant. I had a very successful therapy business that I was running from a, a gym um on in key street which is the center near dean's gate and i was working with people there and uh, but then I, I i did some courses in london and i kept coming down to london i was like london's really good and um back home in manchester my my flatmate at the time his dad's company the carpet cleaning company they had been missold a large insurance contract to take all this insurance work and it actually fell through it never materialized and so they were going to sue the person the person who was suing then died so they couldn't sue the person so they they lost the whole business and then the rest you know and the credit crunch was now kicking yeah. out so it's like 2008 now and it got to a point where his dad was living on our sofa because he'd lost everything and it was a very strange and stressed time to be and i was sick of the rain because <laughs> it rains a lot, you know, and so I kept coming down to, to London and my sister was an artist or she still is an artist and she was living in a tiny studio, like, I mean, tiny studio. Yeah. And she said, look, if you ever want to move to London, you can move down, you can live with me until you get yourself sorted. So I went, okay, cool. Yeah, fine. I'm, I'm very suggestible when people say, suggest me to do something, but like, yeah, okay. I mean, yeah, fine. I've got the time. And so I went back to Manchester and I said to my flatmate, I... I'm going to move to London um, next month. I think I think it was like six weeks time or something like that. And he was like, well, well, why, what do you mean? And I just said, look, I, I'm no longer really sort of very happy in Manchester. A lot of my friends had moved away that I was at university with. My social circle was kind of decreasing and decreasing. 
And I was just a bit bored. And I, I'd been there for 10 years. So I said, um, I'm going to move to London. I'm going to go try my luck in London, basically. I'm going to be like Dick Whittington. Yeah, but, like a rest. And, Yeah, and I remember I, I arrived in London and he was like, he understood why I wanted to go and he was fine. I'm still you know, good friends with him now. And you know, I speak to him regularly. I go up to Manchester and stuff. And um, I, I moved I moved down and I had two bags. Of, I had my laptop and a bag of clothes and that was it. And I, I, came, I got into King's Cross and there was some sort of terror alert going on. And, I was like, <laughs> and so Welcome. it was like armed oh, police, everything running around. I was like, oh. And so I thought, this isn't good. And then I went to, so I live in an area called Muswell Hill, which is in North London, a very sort of neat, 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 yummy, mummy, yeah. great, very nice area. And I sat outside Starbucks and I'd been in and I was ne I stood next to John Sim, the actor, and I thought, it's all right here. No. <laughs> I like celebrity spotting. And, um, and I just thought, yeah, this seems much more like me. And then the weather is different here. I know it sounds... That, but Manchester, it's got its own ecosystem because of where it is with the Pennines, and it and people joke about how much it rains. It it rains a lot, and it becomes depressing, especially if you work from home and you don't need to go out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you're just stuck in, literally stuck in, and so I was very. Uh, and so I do think your environment has a huge impact on how you feel. Yeah, you're where right. you are and who you're with really sort of impacts you. So I moved in with my sister. And it was so small, I couldn't even put the futon down because she can then get, she can get out of bed because uh, she lived on a bed day. And I thought, what am I going to do? Because <laughs> you know, I had no plan. I literally had no plan. But I also had nothing to lose. So, and I think that puts you in a, a really good place in life. It's just like, let's just have a go. Yeah. What's the worst that can happen? What's, what's the risk here? And I didn't have a mortgage. I wasn't in a relationship. And I thought the, the very worst is that I'll move back home to York with my parents. You know, go back, table to my legs, and probably go back to Manchester. You know, apologise to everyone. And But it worked out because I, I contacted this guy who was running this big dating agency place. And he, they gave me a trial. They said, OK, we've got this guy who's doing a premium week course. Costs thousands of pounds, like four or five grand today. He's going to go, and if he goes, we will lose four because we'll have to refund him. If you can convince him to stay or help him, we will take. So I went, okay. So I went in, and I worked with this guy for an, for about two hours, and really, really helped him. And I just got invited. So they used to do a boot camp weekend every weekend, and I walked into this uh, weekend boot camp, and this guy stood up in front of like eighteen guys and all the trainers, and was just saying how much I helped him. So I was then I was then started working there. That was kind of like my way in, yeah. and so I, I worked at. So I was very against the whole misogynistic thing. My ideal clients through the dating. I, I used to work with women as well. Were people who had come out of a long term relationship. They're in their thirties or forties. They just kind of felt lost, had low self esteem, not much of a social circle, and just wanted to rebuild their life. That was my perfect my perfect client. Yeah. Not an 18 year old that just wants to run around chatting with girls. And, and so, sure. and so I started doing that and at about the same kind of time, I got invited down to Brighton to meet this guy who I'd met on a forum, which sounds wrong now. And he said to me, he goes, do you want to come to an, a training event, a half day workshop by a guy called Andrew Austin about moving your eyes and stuff? And I was like, yeah, fine, because again, we've, we found out I'm suggestible. So we went along, and, and I'd never heard of eye movement therapy or EMDR or anything. Yeah. I walked in, and I meet Andrew Austin, and he's a character. He's a real character, Andrew Austin. He, go, he goes to me, do you have a memory, a negative memory which just stands out, a negative memory? And I was like, yes, I do. Hold it, and then starts to move my eyes. And he goes, what's that now like? And at that moment, I realized that my whole life, career, and everything I knew about therapy was going to change. It's what happens, and this is called IEMT, Integral Eye Movement Therapy. And what it does, it takes your experience and it takes you out of it. It makes it objective. So when you think of a negative experience, 
you're usually subjective. That means you're seeing it like you're there. It's usually high quality. And because of the way it's encoded through the limbic system, it's there to keep, to keep you safe, essentially, and your brain's acting like it's going to happen again. Yeah. So when you move the eyes, we don't quite know exactly how it works. It sends signals, we believe, to the hippocampus when you move the eyes in certain ways. And you literally look at the event from who you are today. And it completely changes how you feel about it. So are you saying that it, it changes immediately, like just that one eye yep. processing um, event? It changes process? it straight away. It carries on and it does other stuff as well. And this is only just one small element of the actual process. And I was, I just sat there going at, because you can achieve similar results with NLP with the submodalities moving, changing, swish, and all these different things. But this was like doing it automatically. And I was, I was absolutely baffled. And so, I was like, oh. about, so let me just give some context to trauma and all of that. So I'm currently yeah. doing some therapy called somatic experiencing, which is about body release and your nervous system, I guess, gets um, hardwired into that survival mechanism, right? I've also done EMDR. Um, which was pretty powerful, but I wouldn't say it sort of cured me. But equally, I come from a perspective of having complex kind of trauma from different parts of my life. So, um, but there is just something around what's fascinating to me is that you don't need your story. You don't need to, like a therapy, like old school therapy is like, tell me about the trauma. And you sort of yeah. relive the rape or the thing that, that happened, right? Yeah. You say it over and over again. And in a way, it reinforces the story. Reinforces doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. And so what, what I've found fascinating is that you don't need to tell your story, but these things are stored, as you say, in, in your limbic system, your survival, your nervous system, your body. And actually, if we can work with releasing, maybe that's a different, I don't know if that's the right word from your perspective. But I prefer reprocessing. So reprocessing the trauma in some way. Mm. You change, it doesn't go away, but you change your relationship to it. Okay, so I have a light on in my room here, okay, okay. as you can probably tell. I can turn that light off. It's still there, but there's no energy going to it anymore. And yeah. that's the way I like to sort of think about it. Okay. So you know, you don't remove the memory, you reprocess the memory and you readdress your relationship with it. So I've been doing a lot of research into this and one of my friends is a neuroscientist who came to one of my courses who was just fascinated. And from what I understand about trauma encoding into the memory, you have different levels of the memory. You have sensory memory, short term, long term, and your hippocampus and your amygdala play a vital role in the limbic system to do with encoding of the memory. So generally what happens is that your amygdala, small little you know, organ about the size of an almond, and you have the hippocampus, which looks like a seahorse behind it. Your amygdala regulates fear, emotion, and the quality, the submodalities of the memory. So basically what you're visually seeing and how much fear is uh, attached to this memory. The hippocampus then works like a filing system. So it takes that memory and puts it into the long term. Okay. When you're experiencing trauma, everything slows down because what's happening, there's the more emotion and stimulus and energy um, this, that's going on at the time of what I call encoding, so basically just what's happening, the amygdala works better and the hippocampus works, uh, is impaired. So what happens, you know when people say it was like it was in slow motion? Mm -hmm. That's because your amygdala is like, it's taking on everything. But that can't then be stored properly. In the hippocampus, so you sort of freeze, don't you? It freezes, yeah. Or and the hippocampus becomes overwhelmed, and so it can't put it into long term memory where it belongs, so it kind of keeps it just around essentially. It doesn't get fully processed. The way I like to think about this is like if you imagine a, a library, you have a librarian on a desk, and you have books coming in, which is like the memory or the, the sensory acuity or the sensory information. If you bring a book in to the librarian, she then takes that book and goes on files in and comes back, gets another one. Mm -hmm. That system works well. In trauma, it's like a thousand books turning up at once. Yeah. And it breaks the system. So what we do is we hold on to these memories. It's like um, if you're running a laptop, you've got open windows. You can minimize them, but they're still there. They're and it not uses a lot of energy, like you're saying. 
it's, it's draining, it's exhausting behind the and, screen, your body. And also, when, when you're running your laptop with a lot of open windows, it, it's, everything runs poorly, okay? Also, it's easily to trigger open, um, and you can have what I call like pop-ups, so like intrusive thoughts and flashbacks. Yeah. Okay? What IEMT does, it opens up this memory and closes it. It just closes it, puts it into the long-term storage. Because what happened to you when you were 17 or 9 or something is important when you were then. But the thing is, the way that trauma works is that it's, it's a brilliant book I record, but when the past is always present. Your brain is geared up for this thing that happened to you to happen again. So people live on edge, people live with anxiety. And so I've worked with a lot of people who've come back from conflict um, from Afghanistan and even like a little noise or a doorbell, they, it sets them off because they are still mentally there. Mm -hmm. But they're not there. They're in, you know, Warrington or, you know, in London. They're not in Afghanistan or Basra. But the same can happen. And so what, what happens is that when you have these triggers, you mentally regress back to then yep. and your the way of responding from then. And so, um, and this can be very true. And the thing is, it's like I, I deal with people who have uh, public speaking, for example, because when they were younger, they got, you know, because the British school system is great at traumatizing people. Mm -hmm. And so you get up and speak in front of people or you see other people do it. And it's just as bad because you still take it on. So what happens in present day when you have a stimulus or a trigger, you mentally regress back to that age. And you're able to respond from that age, not from who you are now. So what IEMT does, it allows you to go back to these sensitizing events, but with your life experience going back to that problem and so it allows it to be resolved. The way that I tell people, it's like, you know, your sort of favorite kids programs. When you think about your favorite kids programs, you're thinking about what it was like when you were nine years old watching it. Okay. Not what it's like now. Sure. If you watch your favorite kids program now, you'll be like, this is yeah. very different, but it's not changed. You've changed. And therefore, when, when you change the way you look at something, the thing that you look at actually changes. And it's basically the same with IEMT, in my opinion. So when, um, when you go back to, from who you are now, back to these sensitizing, so what sensitizing events is just the imprint of when, the, you know, when it first was new. Um, you go back to these events, but as you are now, because you're anchored into the present, you look at these things and basically the significance and the meaning just drops. It's like, well, of course that's not a problem. But don't you find that you can, you can know, like I can know that cognitively yeah. that the experience then isn't a problem. I can chat about it. I can analyze Absolutely. it. Be like I am a strong, independent, powerful woman and that bother me. But then in certain moments, my body doesn't know that. Of right. course. And so, so what happens? What happens? The thing is, knowing about a problem is knowing about it. And right. when you actually, uh, when you know what the problem is, but you want to do something, so you have these feelings, this cognitive dissonance. You yeah. want to do something, but you have all this stuff stopping you. Yeah. With IMT, what it does is it finds this feeling, you use the feeling to go to the imprint, and then you process the imprint, you work on these imprints, so it basically smooths it out. So now when you want to do that thing, you're basing it on evidence and what's with what's actually there, not because of your association to the past. Yeah, yeah. So, so you um, get to see it from for what it is, basically. Get some distance from it and decide yeah. how you want to respond. Yeah, absolutely. Than... It gives you choices. So you could respond the way that you did, or you don't have to. If you have a rat that's running around in a box, if you lift that box up, the rat could run the way it was, or it can just do anything else. Sure. So you have choice. Now talk yeah. us just through, you've given us some clues about the process of it. It's about your eye movement and about yeah. kind of bringing in a memory or something. Yeah. For somebody who's never done any trauma therapy and might even not recognize that they have trauma mm -hmm. in their life. First of all, what types of things are IEMT um, specifically good for? Because maybe there's certain things that it really works. And then like, what's the first session? Like, what is the process so somebody can feel a bit confident about like, oh, maybe I should access this. Okay, so uh, you'll either get, you have two types of clients, people who know what the problem is and people who don't. Yeah. And that's generally sort of the thing. They know they're sad, they're unhappy, they're anxious, but they don't know why. 
Yeah. So with IMT, there's a little bit of investigation work. So we look at the feelings which they currently have, and you use the, now IMT does not work on emotion. It works on the imprints that are causing the emotion. It's like, imagine uh, it's like a speaker and sound, okay? The sound is the emotion. The speaker is the imprint, the memory which is causing it. You can't do anything to the sound. You can only stop the speaker. Sometimes that speaker's in a different room. Sure. So you need somebody yeah. to actually help you to find what it is. Yeah. And it usually goes back to very small things. It really does. But the things, that small thing when you're seven is a big thing, such as getting lost in a supermarket, getting lost at the beach or something like that. Very, very common. It doesn't have to be some major stuff. No, no, it usually isn't. Okay. It's usually very small incidences. Um, but it can still impact your of course, yeah. day -day. Because what happens, you then have compounding experiences which create a belief system. Yes. And then you have these beliefs, and you know, there's nothing stronger than belief. And you then use, then you then justify having this belief. Yes. So, for, for example, say that you're at school and a teacher says to you, "You're stupid." You didn't know that before. Now you know it. You're like I'm stupid. So you're now looking. You know, yeah. your brain is now aware of this, and you're basically taking on compounding uh, memories, which creates this belief system. It's like if you're going to go buy a new jacket and you go into like a uh, top shop or something. And you see this jacket and you think, oh, I'm going to buy it. You go out and then you see lots of other people in that jacket, which you'd never noticed before because you didn't know it existed. Yeah. It's the same with a, a belief system in a sense. So you, you experience this thing and, you, and then you have this solid belief system. And you, we keep away from this belief system so we don't trigger it. So we design our lives to not go near these almost like these landmines. So if you think, so if you think you're stupid, but say you want to go for a job, and you want to go for this interview, we feel very nervous and you go, right, actually, I'm not going to go for it because I don't want to work the extra hours. I didn't want to. So you justify why you don't do it. But the reality is you don't want to do it because you feel bad. You feel stupid because when you were seven, a teacher said you were stupid. But saying that doesn't sound crazy. So what I help people to do is on this side, the people who don't know the problem, we go back to these imprints and basically resolve them. So you can go and do that thing much easier. Yeah, than, so uh, than, push, than trying to push through it, you know, you sort yeah. of minimize the the experience. The other, so that, so with ang so anxiety, we look at how anxiety is structured, and we work with people. So that's people who don't know what the problem is. People who do know what the problem is. So I've worked with people who have been uh, just some of my recent cases. Uh, a guy when he was nine years old, he was in a stolen car with his mum and her mum's boyfriend, who was very high on drugs and drunk, and this guy crashed the car and killed his mum in the car. Right? That's, That's when he was nine. Serious point. Yeah, and he's in his 20s now, and he's never never been all right. So no amount of therapy is going to solve that. No. But we can stop the hate for the guy. We can, And the, the, his lasting memories of his mum is her face crushed against the steering wheel and bleeding. Which so when he thinks about his mum, that's what... Yeah. So we, we sort of fixed all that up and again by getting them into the memory moving his eyes so now when he thinks of his mum he remembers his mum and he doesn't care about that guy now it's not about forgiving anyone or anything it's just so now he can sleep at night he can actually go out and trust people and you know what i mean uh something else uh, a boy who i worked with who's 17 recently 17 18 something really bad happened when he was 10 with his dad, we don't know what it was, and I don't, I don't really care, to be honest. Um, you don't need the story. No, no, no. And in the last couple of weeks, he has reconnected with his dad, um, been to see him. He's gone back to college. His anxiety's dropped. You know, he's reducing his medication. Um, I worked with a woman who got trapped in a lift during 9-11, uh, during the terror attacks. And then she came to London, and she was in London for the bombings, again, no. in a lift. Yeah. Oh. And so she's waiting for the third thing yeah so and she lives in manhattan and as you know it's a vertical city so so i helped her use the lift um a guy who i helped in dallas was on a roof he was a he's a property developer and there was a freak gust of wind and he got blown off the roof so he couldn't even go above a second floor and so he was losing work because he was going to meetings and he was shaking and people thought why why is he nervous and yeah. so he was losing, and so he was having to justify all. So again, we just made it so he felt okay. Um, and this is all through IEMT? So yeah, so I, I, I do like two sessions with people. Yeah. Um, I'm not a long-term solution. I'm, 
if you need counseling, this is not care and support. This is change work. It's um, imagine me as like a dentist, right? Like you doing your brushing your teeth every day is care and support. Yeah. I'm there to pull your tooth out to do a filling or an implant. Okay. I don't care how it's happened. That's not my, you know, yeah. I'm just there to fix the thing. And then you need to go and now some people will come to work with me for two sessions. I will then refer them to somebody else for continuing to work. You might work. need both, right? You might yeah, need absolutely. Both. Absolutely. But also a lot of the time people need to learn a skill set and I can help them with the emotion. So a lot of people come to me and go, right, I've seen you on stage or I've seen and I want to be a really good public speaker. I'm like, okay, well, these are all the training courses. Well, no, I have stage fright. I can help you with the stage fright. I can't make you a good public speaker. So I can help with the emotion. I can then send you to go and do the, the course. And you need but, to practice. Yeah. But doing the course without all the anxiety, you're going to learn to much faster rates. And, you know, it's just much easier to do it. So Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating just to approach even just anxiety or, or depression or some of the things that people face from a trauma perspective. Because mm. that was fascinating where you might not know what the trauma was or that there was any but this could still be a relevant approach to you just because you can see negative impact on your day-to-day -day life. Basically, the worse that something's happened to you, generally, the more I can help you. You know, that's the worst that you are. I, I, the worst kind of person for me to work with is somebody who's just, they don't, they just, I, just, I want to be motivated or something, you know something, that kind yeah. of, there's you nothing wrong. And yeah, can, right? yeah. But it's just, what do you want? I don't know. I'm just a bit unhappy. Um, I, I can't really do anything for you. If somebody comes to you, what happened? Well, I, I got stabbed four years ago and I haven't been back to work since. Right, we're off to the races. This is something which I can really, really help. In fact, I had this guy. Now, everything I talk about, I've got permission to do so. I've done interviews. I do a lot on my YouTube channel. I do half an hour interviews with past clients. I, half an hour, really in-depth interviews. Just uh, go on YouTube, Matt Kendall, you can find hours and hours of material on there. Um, this guy came to do my training course the other week. He's from Manchester. He was a teacher and he's a big guy. He's like six foot two, six foot three. Big, big Mancunian fella. Uh, Skinner guy and bit of PE teacher, Bill. And um, he, he was working in this pretty bad school. And one day there was this pretty reckless, you know, juvenile. And he this guy beat the crap out of this teacher in a corridor and uh, nobody came to help him since then his career has gone off a cliff uh, it's been really hard he hasn't been back to that school all this kind of stuff he came to do my training course and when you do the training course you get a lot of work done on yourself because you're working with 11 different therapists in the, you know in the same room and i actually do demos at the front and i did a demo with this guy about the ptsd model and we worked on this particular problem that night he was out in london and because he's not a londoner he didn't realize you shouldn't use your phone in the street because you'll get mugged you right? standard practice and he was around london bridge area and he came out of a, a like a, a food shop or something and these four guys surrounded him he was on his phone now usually that would have sent him into a spiral his legs would have gone he would have run up what he did this time is he took his phone turned it off put it in his pocket zipped his jacket up popped his car and said evening lads and walk through them and just kind of walk past them and he and he came the next day because i was on the saturday saturday night on the sunday so how are you interesting story and he told us this story in a very factual thing this is what happened this was i did how i would have responded would have been this way but i was able to so it's not about building the confidence up it's about un taking away these underpinning problems and he's now gone back to manchester and is he says he's gone back to the way he was before the incident basically he's got his natural confidence back and yeah so it really is very life-changing stuff and a very short approach my favorite kind of clients are those who have had something really bad happen to them and it's changed the course of their life now most people want to get back to the what they were like before but unfortunately look what's in front of them now so you can only move on from where you are now so i work with a lot of people who have been sexually assaulted physically assaulted um been in an accident lost a limb uh seen something being part of an accidental death and and uh, now the people that we're working with we're getting lots of people who are who are who have worked in the nhs and also the emergency services 
Because as you can imagine, working in the emergency services, you're taking on trauma on a regular basis. Yeah, all the time. Yeah, so IMT is, uh, so it stands for integral or integral eye movement therapy or technique, if you like. So it's a weekend course. And so you don't have to be a therapist. It's open to all. But generally, the people who I like are already therapists or working doctors, GP, whatever it might be, who want to add this to their skills. So it's it's a weekend course. It's a very specific technique. And it works really well with coaching, so you can actually work, use it with different models as well. And we've just had CPD status, uh, continued professional development, uh, yeah, official status. Okay. Yeah. So that means now we can really now sort of attract different types of people. I might even start running the, the courses from hospitals, to be honest. That's where. We're good and, at yeah, we're doing much more research into it. Um, and it's a very sort of progressive and growing area. It's, it's a very exciting area to work in. And the feedback which I get from the people who do my course and how they've worked with them. Um, and I put them, I, I try to give as much evidence as possible and to investigate people, no, have people investigate it. Because a lot of therapy, especially like the sort of the, the alternative therapy that work on a meridian system or something, they're like, oh, it works because of, you know, magic and we don't like science. But, you know, because, you know, IMT is very much like we want you to investigate this and tell us how yes. it works. Yeah. So, so it works on neurology as opposed to, like, you know, magic and energy. Yeah, that's that's um, fascinating. Um, so we've got your YouTube channel you mentioned. We'll put that in the show notes. Where else can people find you if they're uh, looking to work with you or connect with you or come on a training course? Okay, if you want to come on a training course, I run them once a month from london i'm probably going to be doing some around the country as well it's iemtacademy.com so iemtacademy.com um i spend a lot of time on facebook you can just i think it's the mac kendall my name on that something like that but also i've got facebook pages and groups i've got just type in iemt academy you'll find me everywhere if you just google my name matt kendall yeah i've got loads of stuff online i've got a lot a lot of talks and a lot of um on where have i got loads of stuff on linkedin i've got loads and loads of people on linkedin and again i've got a lot of linkedin recommendations from other therapists and other people again check everything out you know I'm, sure and if you want to speak to the people who have worked i've got a lot of interviews with people who i've worked with and a lot of people who i've trained For so sure. it comes from both, both angles so yeah facebook um i do a little bit on instagram to be honest that's not worth checking me out on um i run something called psych talks which is a monthly speaking event in london which i'm just starting which is just psych p s y p s p s y c i c a s yeah yeah p s y c find you and put it in the site site p s p y s psych talks.co.uk i can't remember which way it goes around p s y c h talks.co.uk which is a monthly event it costs 10 or 20 quid or something it's really cheap and you get like four or five speakers uh in a private members club which is great Sounds good. And I think that's yeah. about it. Basically, yeah, well, get me on Facebook. You message me on Facebook. I like talking. So if you, if you have any questions about it, I have also written uh, a handbook, basically like an intro. Uh, I called it the Complete Guide, which was a, a bit of a lie. It's, it's an intro to IEMT, completely free of charge. I'm not going to send you loads of emails and stuff. My training courses are always full. And I'm not trying to, you know, it's, it's kind of like if you like the sound of it and you like what the people are saying, get in contact and I'm booked up now for a couple of months. You know, it's always a couple of months in advance booked up. Um, and I get different types of people coming to the course. I get those who are therapists who want to add it to their skill set, those people who want to get into therapy and those people who have no interest in going to therapy. They just want to work on themselves. They want to work through their own problems. And that, so I train to all three levels so anyone can come yeah yeah anyone. so uh we're coming to the end of our time we'll add all that into the show notes finally what do <laughs> you think is the the key skill set that you have developed that has allowed you to be successful in the way that you are so what's maybe that foundation skill set so i know you know iemt and but mm -hmm. i've always admired your your perseverance your entrepreneurial skills the yeah. way you adapt i don't know what do you think has been the core skill set i think that <sighs> I've always just sort of got on with stuff. Yeah, um, you just keep going, keep moving. Yeah, I just go on, just go on. And the thing is, once you realise, and I know this sounds sort of, uh, people might find it depressing, people don't care about you. They don't care if you succeed, they don't care if you fail. All they care about is themselves. They don't care. I was on the tube the other day. There was this woman dressed as a fairy and there's a guy further down dressed as a bear. No one 
No one even looked at them. You know what I mean? So if you think about, oh, do you, do you care about this mistake I made 10 years ago? No, take a second. Don't we obsess over. Don't yeah, we? No one cares. Literally yeah. nobody cares. And we live in a very sort of vacuous society with Instagram where I know some people, if they put a picture, if they don't get a certain amount of likes, they're going to have a bad day. What, what's that about? Um, so I really do think that I don't like people who try really hard at stuff. Um, I think it's, I think it's sort of desperation more than anything. Are you uh, saying that you haven't had to try hard for the work that you've gotten to? I, I, I put effort in, yeah. but, but I've worked harder. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Massively. Absolutely. Ma but the thing is, I live a very charmed life. You know, I get to do amazing work with people I really respect and help people that really need help. And I work maybe a few hours a day. Yeah. I, love I don't that. own a house. I don't, you know, but I could work much, much harder, make much more money, own a house. But will I have, so today I'm doing this interview. It's a Monday or something. Yes. This afternoon, I'm going to go down to the gym. I'm going to do like a couple of hours work and then I'm going to go for a swim and use the gym. Tonight, I think I might go see a film, right? I could work really hard for a long time. So in 20 years time, I could have the lifestyle I have now. Yeah, so it's thinking consciously what's the outcome that you want and about the lifestyle rather than just push, push, push for the sake of... Yeah, yeah, I, I just, and this is why I think sort of all these sort of, um, I, I don't believe that if you're an entrepreneur, you've got to get up at five in the morning. Like, I've got a, I've got the book, I'm, I'm going to throw it away, like the five, a, I got up at 5 a.m. and it was awful. <laughs> it was, it was awful. It was really cold and dark. It wasn't inspired. What a terrible way to live. Yeah, right? yeah, it really is an awful way to live, and I really hate people who read loads of books. Like that's an impressive. I read fifty books a year. What well, What have you done? Yeah, this is the important thing. Reading an autobiography is not work. <laughs> it's really not. And people who and people who need mentors and all these different. Just get on with it. If If you're this, if you're creating something that doesn't have people who want to work with your stuff they want to buy you don't have a business yeah yeah, yeah. You, know, you don't have it you've got to identify a need and then fulfill that need don't create the worst thing to do is create a product and service and then go and look for customers that's the most stupid thing in the world what you want to do is basically you want to almost be like a legal drug dealer in a sense you actually want to have something that there's a need for and a need and a desire for and then you basically tailor your services and your product to that audience. And you then just get constant feedback and develop and sort of change what you're doing. So the actual product and service that you're offering is not half as important as the feedback and the relationship you have with your, with your clients, your potential yeah. clients. And then you tailor what you're doing. So what I'm doing now is very different to what I was doing. I'm not running business networking events. I'm running, you know, training course. yeah i love that so it's taking action learning from what you act you do and um creating that feedback loop to then adapt how well, people you become if you look at like i've been watching a lot of dragons den recently on youtube i don't know why you know when you click on one and then you go so like, yeah. and people become overly attached to their thing their product or their service and if you do that you know life moves on and so yeah there's always going to be people. So when, when I work with people, you know, if I was overly attached to hypnosis and hypnotherapy, I wouldn't have learned IMT. I wouldn't be where I am today. I wouldn't be able to help the people the way that I help them. So if you're really overly attached to the thing that you do, or if you think that you're sort of important and attach too much meaning to that, you know, no job is beneath you. And so when I run events and stuff, I'm often putting out chairs and cleaning up stuff. You know, I'm not like, oh, I have people that do it. I will get my hands dirty and I will always be that level. You know what I mean? And I think that a lot of people when they're in business and especially in the coaching industry, when they get a little bit of success, they become really super arrogant and they're posting pictures of like, I'm working from Bali and all those seven figure. You know, and, I, and I know that they're Instagram culture. Oh, it's a, it is the Instagram culture. And, and I think that we have with this whole Instagram and people, pretending to be happy i am I'm, I'm, i think i'm the happiest person i know but i'm not positive i just like i like being me 
Um, yeah, I'm, but I'm not, I don't. I don't jump out of bed in the morning. I hate getting up in the morning. But I'm very honest. You know what I mean? I'm very honest. You know, I drink far too much. I I get angry. I don't really get angry. I'm grumpy. I hate a lot of stuff. But I'm I'm happy. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I'm happy you're that doing you and you're yeah exactly. Content. Um, I love this. Uh, we've got to <laughs> we've got to finish this. Um, I have to say that I I don't fully agree with everything, but I think you're doing you, and I admire that. Right? I well, think that's it. you don't have to agree. I'm not saying yeah, yeah, you. Yeah. It's, it doesn't. It's not going to affect my day. <laughs> you know. So yeah, well, exactly. And so it's owning what you're good at, the skill set, and the method that works. Yeah. And yes, yeah, yeah. There's loads of noise out there and information about how you could do things, but ultimately, I do agree with you on this. It's about experimenting and finding what's right for you and just making some choices around how you want to spend your time. And it's also by doing sort of different things as well, because people get kind of stuck in a rut. So tomorrow I'm going to go see the Russell Howard show being filmed. I'm going oh, by myself because my flatmate dropped out. But just um, going to different places and doing different things. And eat. so people want to, this is, I'll, I'll finish on this one. Yeah. <laughs> I know you've got to go. So a lot of people want to make a massive change in their life. Yeah. Yet yeah, they're not able to make a small change. So, for example, most people have the same six or seven meals That's all, true. all the time. Yeah. So, and it's like, you know, when like most people have a very structured life and like they will always have a takeaway on a Friday and whatever it is. And if you say to them, instead of ordering that pizza, why don't you order this pizza? They were like, are you mad? <laughs> you know what I mean, of course I'm not going to, of course I'm not going to have a madras rather than that, you know. Yeah. And so you want to be a multimillionaire or you want to be the, but you can't change a meal. Yeah. So, so what you want to do is you want to learn about variety in, in what you do. So I, I'm always changing my diet. I'm always cooking different things and going to different places and experiencing different things. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's, so it's about, you know, change is not one, um, oh, one. And the thing is, if you do a massive change, and this is what I've found. So I've worked with people who have had like gastric band surgery. I've worked with people who have won a lot of money, inherited a lot of money, um, or just got a lot of money for some reason. And they think what you think the solution is to your problem is, is not the solution. And you shouldn't be making goals when you're in a problem. So the fat person wants to be skinny, not just healthy weight, but skinny. The poor person wants to be rich, not just comfortable. So what would the work that I kind of do is I get them from one end of the perspective, just to the middle, mm. rather than going the other way. Because the thing is, if you're broke, it's because you're bad with money. And if I give you a million pounds, you're, you've just got a lot of reason, a lot of resources to ruin your life. If you look at the lottery winners, yeah. Look at yo-yo dieters. Yeah. You know, you look at so people will tend to be one or the other. I try to bring people to the normal middle because the thing is, when you feel okay, you don't need to feel great and powerful. I have no desire to feel great and powerful. And like, and the, the thing is, the, the self the self development industry feeds off people with insecurity who feel like rubbish and they feel beneath and unworthy and they're making them stand and obviously if you get all your sort of adrenaline and everything you're, you feel great but you've not achieved anything you've just stood on a chair and hugged a stranger but you've not you know you've yeah. not changed your you your job in place yeah. afterwards um matt if people want to uh, find you some more we're going to put all your uh links okay. to the show notes because it sounds like i'm going to check out your your youtube and your uh, oh, it's fun yeah it's good it's good <laughs> sounds really good thank you so much for your You're very time. welcome uh good luck for the rest of your day chilling out and watching a movie i love it thank you Thanks for listening to the Adversity to Advantage podcast. Please do subscribe and review on iTunes. Every comment makes a difference. We really appreciate hearing from you. And please do get in touch through PetraBelzebor.com if you're interested in any training, coaching, therapy, or just to join the community and get more information on ways that you can build your own resilience. Until next time.